Hi and welcome to Chess TV. In this week's episode, we'll give you the third part of the NIMS Indian Defense in the opening score with Amelia and Alfred. Albert will tell you about an interesting executive education program and I'll challenge you with not one, but two tricky chess puzzles. After that, Anna Johansson will tell you a story about the Swedish royal court in the 18th century. But first, if you're looking for something to do during the Christmas holiday, I'd sincerely recommend a trip to Singapore, where the Singapore International Chess Festival will be played between the 26th and the last of December. More information can be found at singaporechess.org.sg. And why not go straight to New Zealand, where the Queenstown Chess Classics will be played from January the 15th to the 23rd at the ballroom of the Millennium Hotel in Queenstown. We'd also like to congratulate Vietnam and Thailand, who both won medals at the SEA Games. Vietnam won gold medals in the C Games Mixed Pair and Blindfold competitions, while Thailand won the gold in the Asian Chess event. But now it's time for some opening score with Amelia and Alfred. Here we go. As promised, we'll continue with analyzing the NIMS of Indian defense in this week's episode of the opening school. Last week, we saw what happens after White's less popular fourth moves, knight queen to b3 and f3. And today, we will analyze one of White's more popular moves. After the introducing moves d4, knight to f6, c4, e6, knight to c3, and bishop to b4, White has lots of moves to choose between. And we'll today see what happens if White chooses to play the Rubinstein variation, which occurs after e3. Now it's Black turn to pick one of several moves. Black can either choose to play castle kingside, c5 or b6. Let's begin with analyzing b6. The move prepares for bishop to b7 and goes hand in hand with the Black's plan to target the center by using pieces instead of pawns. Black does now threaten to play bishop to b7, which does not only give him control over the e4 square, but also a very nice diagonal. White can do nothing effective regarding the diagonal, but White can regain some measure of control over the e4 square by either trying to remove the pinning of the c3 knight or by using his pieces to strengthen the control over the square by playing bishop to d3, for example. A knight to e2 is the more popular continuation, and the plan is to play a3 and offer an exchange of c3 to recapture with the knight, giving White a very nice development. So black cannot allow this to happen, after knight to e2, and so he plays bishop to a6, threatening the now weak pawn on c4. As a black player in this line, you always have to be careful not to play the move d5 too early, because if black would have done that, instead of bishop to a6 in this position, white's queen to a4 check would win a piece and leave black in a terrible position. White should go on with this a3 idea, because black cannot take on c4 as long as the bishop on b4 is threatened. And after a capture on c3, and white recaptures with the knight, the pawn is protected once again by the bishop on f1. But black can actually use this by playing d5, because it's a question of perspective. You can, see as, uh, you can see it as if white is protecting the pawn with the bishop, but at the same time, the pawn is pinned. Because after d5 and a capture on d5, black can exchange bishop on f1, destroying white's chances for a castle. And after e takes on d5, white has a weak king and a weak bishop. So white should not capture on d5. Instead, he is to protect the pawn on c4 by playing b3. Black should not stop at this point, but instead continue with the attack against the c4 pawn. But before black can do that, he has to protect his king by playing castle kingside. This is quite important because if white would be able to reach a4 with the queen, black would have a tough time trying to protect all of his pieces. After the castle, white plays bishop to e2, 
preparing a castle and black plays knight to c6 with the future threat of knight to a5 threatening the pawn on c4. The plan is to force black to take on d5. Maybe white won't lose his ability to castle, but the black squared bishop would continue to be very weak since it's locked in its place by its own pawns. Black can also choose to play bishop to e7 instead of exchanging a c3. The plan is quite simple and it is to use the awkward knight on e2 against white, but even though it could be placed in a better square, it could also be far worse. The pawn on c4 is threatened and so white moves the knight to f4. White has once again used his plan to exchange an f1 by playing d5. And this time white should capture on d5, because after the exchange on f1 and black's recapture on d5, followed by an exchange of knights, white can play queen to h4, giving him an active enough position to compensate for the bad bishop. White threatens to take on d5 in this position, but also to play knight to e6, forking the queen and the pawn on g7, and black cannot take on the knight since the pawn is pinned. Black should here play bishop to g6, 5, and now follows knight to e6, g6, queen takes on g5, f takes on e6, and an exchange of the queens on d8. The white bishop is still weak, but since we have reached an end game, white can advance with his pawns and release it. Black can also play c6 instead of bishop to g5, but it leads to a less favorable position for black after knight to e6, g6, queen to e5, bishop to f6, knight takes on d8, bishop takes on e5, knight takes on f7, king takes on f7, d takes on e5, knight to d7, and f4. White is a full pawn up and a very important advantage, and often doubly so when in the end games. After this continuation, the best black can hope for is a draw, and that is if white makes some major mistakes. The position we get from playing the Rubinstein variations are very interesting, and a lot happens in the games which follows. But we will end this week's episode of the opening school here, and we'll be back again next week with even more on the Nimzo Indian. So see you then. We all know there's a lot of strategy in chess, and who doesn't need knowledge of strategy? It used to be the coveted knowledge of kings and world leaders, nowadays more popular in the corporate world. So what better and more fun way to teach it than by using chess? And that's exactly what the Chess and Corporate Strategy Association does. It's an innovative approach to executive education an ideal tool to support enterprises when facing global market challenges. The official information states that the Chess and Corporate Strategy Association has realized a course of executive education inspired by the noble game of chess through the combination of its strategic dynamics with the professional challenges that determine the success or failure of a company in the global markets. The initiative targets leading enterprises and managers who wish to increase their expertise and professional skills in the field of strategic thinking, problem solving and decision making. If you are not completely sold to the concept and link between chess and corporate strategy, yet this might help. The course includes lectures on advanced strategic thinking, approach to risk and uncertainty management, where risk returns matrices are applied to chess and to financial and industrial portfolios, decision theory where decision trees, game theory and matrices are studied in their qualitative, quantitative, deterministic and statistical features. And then there's also a, no a negotiation tournament where participants are divided into peers to negotiate on several case studies. From a chess player's point of view, this really makes me appreciate what chess has taught me. Decision making, goal setting 
and risk calculations are all things that come naturally for chess players. The brain behind the Chess and Corporate Strategy Initiative is Luca Desiata, a business strategy expert uh, that has a passion for chess. On November the 26th, the first Chess and Corporate Strategy Prize will be awarded at the prestigious Villa Lazzaroni in Torre di Quinto 58 in, in Rome. The prize is awarded by the Chess and Corporate Strategy Association in collaboration with INSEED Alumni Association Italy and Nova Italian MBA Association, two leading representatives of the Italian and international corporate world who distinguish themselves for an innovative and successful strategic approach. The winners are Francesco Starazza, CEO of ENEL Green Power, and Melissa Peretti, VP Marketing American Express. Congratulations. In order to see yourself as a true chess player, you almost have to know the immortal game, a true work of art in chess. It is in that game that Olof Andersen, the best chess player in the 1850s, sacrificed two rooks, one bishop, and ended the game with a queen sacrifice to checkmate his opponent. But we've already had the last moves here on Chess TV as a puzzle, so in this week's episode, I thought it would be great to search for the last moves that Olof Andersen played into other of his games. The first puzzle we'll look at, Andersen played against Jean Dufresne in 1852 as white. And just as in the mortal game, Andersen sacrificed almost all his pieces, namely a piece, a rook and his queen. I'll give you one minute to find the checkmate in three moves that white performs on black. Good luck. has not only just a few pieces left, but he is also just one move away from being checkmated. In these puzzles, where we know that we are only one move away from being checkmated ourselves, we know that we must check in all our moves. This knowledge helps us to sift out 11 moves, two of which still seems as fairly possible answers, namely bishop to f5 and bishop to b5. Bishop to b5 check forces black to move the king due to the double check. When the king goes to c8, we can play bishop to d7 check, and then black's only move is to king d8, after which we can checkmate with bishop captures on e7 checkmate. But on bishop to b5 check, black can get away with his king to e6 too. In order for ourselves not to get checkmated, we must check black again, but in the next move, he captures our f6 pawn, and then we become a very easy target. Bishop to f5 check, however, blocks the e6 square, but let's go of this c6 square instead. So what happens now after king to c6? Well, white can play bishop to d7, and amazingly enough, it is checkmate. On black's other option, king e8, we play bishop to d7 checkmate. And if black plays king d8, we checkmate by playing bishop captures on e7, and that's also what we play on king to f8. The next chess puzzle was played by a 21 year older Andersen, and even this game started in the Evans Gambit, a gambit in which black is often not allowed to castle. In this game, Andersen has sacrificed only two pawns, but yet his opponent, none other than Salman Rosenthal, is in great danger. So, one minute, four moves, white wins, good luck.
can figure out that white needs to check in every single move to be able to checkmate in four moves. Because if we let black sacrifice the bishop on f2 and the queen on g2 with checks, we no longer have enough moves to checkmate on. But the problem is that we can find five different checking moves, but none of them really stand out as a good one. Before you start to sift through your candidate moves and analyze one move after the other, it's a good idea to analyze this, this situation from a strategic point of view first. We see that it would be a great thing if we just could open up the line for the rook to the king. And that's actually easier than you first might think. All we have to do is to check with the knight either on d6 or f6 and uh, in the same time not allowing to block the queen and thus forcing black to take the knight, we will play knight to f6 check. If the queen takes the knight, we capture black with the pawn on f6, and whatever black plays, knight to e6 or bishop to e3, we checkmate with queen to e7. But if black instead takes the knight with his pawn, and we capture black with our pawn, the situation is a little different given that black has his queen left. And with this queen, he can play queen to e4, a move that blocks queen to e7. What we do is to capture his queen with our rook, black must play knight to e6, and we checkmate with queen to e7. Both of these chess puzzles were played by Anders Jan, and even though they came up in the same opening, the Evans Gambit, the puzzles actually required somewhat of a different way of thinking to be solved. The first puzzle required a good tactical thinking, and the second one required a good strategic thinking. If you usually play gambits, it's important to practice a lot in solving chess puzzles, because gambits are known for arising complicated positions where you just can't afford to miss the often emerging opportunities for tactical maneuvers. If you, on the other hand, don't play gambits, but are good at solving chess puzzles, I would actually recommend you to try to play a gambit, just to make your games more interesting. During the recent visit to the National Arts Museum here in Stockholm, we could show a fantastic piece of furniture made in silver and containing a chessboard. It had been standing in the grand bedchamber of Queen Hedvig Eleonora. It was recorded in an inventory of furniture from 1715, which is the year she died. It was probably manufactured sometime around the year 1700. If she really had played chess on that board is not known, but if we move forward a bit in history, we encounter a more well-documented interest in chess at the Swedish court. By digging in the inventory registers of the museums here in Stockholm, I have found some traces of chess interest from the King Adolf Fredrik, who gave a very special chess set to his wife, Queen Louise Ulrika and I hope we can return to this in a later episode. The gift from Adolf Fredrik to Louise Ulrika that otherwise had made a mark in history is the so-called China Castle in the park of Drottingholm. Louise Ulrika is mentioned in encyclopedias for her broad cultural interest and not least her interest in the game of politics. But she also appears to have been interested in the game of chess. This is what she looked like according to Wikipedia during her period as queen. The topic I will say a few words about today is a somewhat strange portrait hanging in the Gripsholm castle. It portrays an odd person in Swedish history and has a clear coupling both to Lovisa Ulrika and to chess. Before we take a look at this painting, I will mention a few facts about the background of this person. His name was Adolf Ludwig Gustav Friedrich Albert Badin, but his original name was Cushy, and in Sweden it was simply called Badin, or possibly Badin if it should be pronounced in a French style. The word means something like a jester. He was probably born in 1747 or maybe a few years thereafter 
in the West Indies on the Danish island of St. Croix, and he was originally a slave. He was probably bought by a Danish sea captain and passed on to another owner before he was given as a gift to Luisa Ulrika. He was allowed to grow up in the close circle of the royal family and Luisa Ulrika used him for an experiment in freestyle of upbringing. He became a playmate of the children of the royal family. He was described as somewhat wild but became very popular and turned out to be quite intelligent. He learned to speak French and took part as a dancer in the theatrical life and, as mentioned in Wikipedia, took part in an erotic play with a French theatre group. He became a member of several private societies, was married twice but died without any children in 1822, so he became roughly 70 years old. Well, what about the connection to chess then? Well, he probably learned chess and probably from Luisa Ulrika. And in the portrait from the Gripsom Castle that we see here, he is indeed sitting in front of a chessboard holding a chess piece in his hand. Well, with that little episode in the chess history, we end for today, but we'll return again next week, so see you then. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back again next week with a new episode, so see you then.